yeah, we are all looking very beautiful. Bit tired maybe, but uh, now Danny's going to tell his uh, story. I mean, I told him that this is his playground, this is his hour, he can do with it whatever he wants. Um, so I guess it's going to be a lot of fun, and maybe some some tears in between, but then fun again. I mean, that would be nice. <laughs> so uh, I leave uh, the stage f uh, to Danny. Am I on now? Can you hear me now? There we go. Just a matter of hitting the right switch. Thank you. My name is Danny, and as I've said, and I'm sure you realize by now talking to me, <laughs> I am a real live recovered alcoholic. And, um, I, you know, I'm having so much fun here. I'm just having so much fun talking to you guys. It's just such a pleasure to talk to you guys who are into the deal and I, you know, I was also bowled over by the, uh, by the number of newcomers that you had at, at a conference like this. I think if we had more newcomers in, in the states that would come to conferences like this, big book based recovery. And man, I, I think the, I think the tide would turn. The tide would turn in our fellowship in the United States. You guys, are, I'm almost jealous. I want to move here. You know, I can hang out with you guys, eat, eat that food downstairs. Was that unbelievable? Oh man. Burger King. <laughs> well, um, I was talking to to to, uh, to Jen. I'm now, now it's my turn to pick on Jen. <laughs> last last time he was a drooling, snot sniveling, knee crawling, snot flinging drunk. Now I don't know. I'll come up with something else different this time. But uh, and thanks, Jen, for 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 having us here. We're really having a great time. Um, it's just so good to be around other alcoholics, and um, and to be able to tell my story. Um, I enjoy telling my story. I tell it very well, as a matter of fact. I'm the only one that knows it the way I do, and um, as, as we do our, all of our stories. What I try to do is um, I don't just tell my story just for the sake of telling my story and give you a whole bunch of, you know, we, we all know what a drunk log is. Um, what, I, what Jens and I were talking, there's so many newcomers in here, and there's so many different st parts of a, of, of a typical alcoholic story, unless you unless you weren't an alcoholic that long, and most of us have gone, you know, I was almost 30 years drinking dr drinking like an alcoholic. Um, I don't know exactly during that time when, when I specifically became an alcoholic, but I know I was certainly a potential alcoholic early on. Um, I'll, I'll explain some of the, uh, some of where I come from. Uh, most people know, well, everyone knows by now that I'm originally, I'm from New York. I'm from New York City. I'm a city boy. And um, I, I grew up in a place called the Bronx. You, you've heard of the Bronx? You heard of the New York Yankees? No? <laughs> They're from the Bronx, the Bronx Bombers. And um, I'm basically a city boy that grew up on the streets of the Bronx. And um, there's nothing really special about growing up in the Bronx. It's just a, it's just a place to grow up. Um, now the Bronx is, it's not what it used to be, but, you know, Still, people are living there, and uh, I'm sure becoming alcoholics also. There's, there's nothing special about that. But when I was a little kid, um, you know, we go back and we try to figure out. I, I've never, I've been blessed not to have been the type of alcoholic who got into this deal and tried to psychoanalyze myself and figure it out. Who did something to me that made me this way? God damn it! Who can I blame? You know, did my mother drop me on my head? When I was six months years old, maybe that was it. Or maybe um, maybe those nuns just beat me up too much. Uh, or maybe I just had too much God crammed down my throat. Or so. it's nothing like that. I had I didn't have the best of families growing up. I didn't have the worst of families. It was just a family. Today they call it dysfunctional because it's not perfect. So what? I mean, I know it was, it was what you would call a broken family. And um, I could say it was an alcoholic family, but then it sounds like I'm blaming that for my alcoholism. Fact is, I was born into a family. I had a predisposition toward alcoholism, and I fell into it accidentally. I'm sure there are people who fall into alcoholism, uh, who don't fall into alcoholism, who also have a predisposition. They just, I don't know, they, they, they just seem to escape it. I, you know, it, it said that if we knew, I know that if I knew when I was going to cross that line and become an alcoholic, and I can't tell you exactly when. I know approximately when it was. But if I knew when that was, 
when I would have damaged my body so badly that there was just no going back, I would have just taken it right up to that date and just backed off. And I would have had plenty of fun up until that time. And I would have been safe. And I would not be an alcoholic today. I'd just be somebody who would become one if I kept drinking. But none of us ever stop in time. We just keep going, you know. And... Um, but growing up, um, it, you know, it was a pretty fa- fairly normal life. I had two sisters, uh, was from a broken family. You know, my mother basically raised us. And, um, I re- you know, we talk about feelings of inadequacy and a lot of that stuff. And that's that's all good, you know, it's all good to look at. Um, there was something that happened to me when I drank, not before I drank. There's something that happened to me when I, when I realized that alcohol was going to fix something. I realized it was going to change me into something that I wanted to be. And even as far as I look back, the only time I could ever remember really feeling, and I didn't think it was wrong at the time, but I remember my mother taking me to the first grade, and she walked in. I'm looking, you know, I'm looking at this room right now. It was a room just like this, and she took me to the first grade. I guess I was, what, six years old? You know, the Beatles were on. and That was 1960-something or whatever, early 60s. And she brought me... To this, to a room that looked kind of like this. It was like a gymnasium type room. And I remember coming up to the door and I couldn't wait to go to school because I, I would be with other kids and, you know, I, I just wanted to be a part of things all the time. And I had friends on the block and they kind of beat me up every once in a while and I got sick of that. And, uh, I got brought to school and I, and I, I and I couldn't believe when I walked into school what I saw. First of all, I th- it was nothing like what I expected at whatsoever. Nothing. Because I thought it was going to be, you know, a classroom. There's going to be a desk and there's going to be a teacher up there with, with long legs and an apple on her desk and a blackboard and, and other kids sitting in there and, and they would just sit me down and we'd learn mathematics, but that wasn't it at all. It was a big room like this and it was full of kids and they were all throwing papers at each other and, some of them were crying. Some of them were crapping in their pants. Some of them were laughing. and so all the, This whole mix of kids. And I walked in, and I was shocked that there were so many other children like me on the planet. I thought I was the only. I thought it was me and the kids on my block, and that was about it. But here, here it looked to me, I'm sure it wasn't 100 kids, but it looked like me about to be 100 kids in this room. And they're all looking around, and I just, I froze. And I just said, I remember think I remember thinking to myself, even as a little kid, I can't, I can't, I can't go in there. I, how am I going to do that? I can't do that. It was just overwhelming to me. Of course, I didn't have any choice. You know, I was getting thrown in there and had to go to school. And um, that's a that's really the only the only early childhood connection that I could ever make to anything that had anything to do with me just feeling bad. And uh, later on, when I I became, uh, when I, I guess I was, um, I'd say 12 years old. I guess uh, I was in, uh, I was in grammar school still. I was in the eighth grade. And, uh, that was when I had my first drink. And it was me and, uh, this kid, uh, it was a whole planned thing. I was gonna, I didn't accidentally get drunk and, and just, you know, hey, wow, that's good. I, I planned it. I wanted to get drunk because other, other people were getting drunk. And I, and I asked around. I did some research. I said, well, well, tell me about it. What does it feel like? Oh, it feels good. Makes you dizzy. Makes you, uh, makes you do stupid things. I said, well, I don't know. That doesn't sound so good to me, <laughs> you know. And, uh, me, me and my friend Sal, um, another friend of mine from the Bronx, we had planned out, we're, we're gonna drink. We're gonna get drunk. And he had these, uh, his father was, uh, was, was from Italy. And he used to make his own wine in the basement. Homemade Italian wine. We used to call it Guinea Red, and uh, affectionately, of course, but that was what they called it. And uh, it was the worst smelling shit you ever, oh my God, I could, it smelled a little bit like vinegar, it smelled a little bit like wine, it looked like, it was black. I mean, I, it was black and we used to put it in, anyway, he put it in these big mayonnaise jars and he gave me this big fat Hellman's mayonnaise jars about, about this, this big, and uh, we went up on a rooftop in the Bronx, and I just started drinking it down. And I just, we just started drinking. Before long, I started to feel an effect. And man, I was blown away. They told me 
you know, these guys told me that they were going to get dizzy, that I was going to get dizzy, and all these other cool things were going to happen, and that didn't sound so cool. The one thing that I heard, though, is that when you, if you had a girl with you, and if you gave her some, she'd take her shirt off. <laughs> that was really appealing to me, but Sal, I didn't care about Sal's shirt coming off. He, but we sat there and got drunk, and I felt empowered for the first time in my life. Just I didn't. I felt like something was missing, and suddenly it got plugged in. Something just got. It was like there was holes in my head, and it just got filled. I didn't feel. I didn't feel like I felt that day when I walked into the first grade class. I just didn't feel that way. I felt normal. You know what I'm talking about? Feeling normal. I mean, did you feel normal? Do you feel normal until we find this deal? Did you ever feel normal without the booze? Never. I just never felt normal. And this made me normal. And, um, and I just took it and flew with it, man. I just, it, it, just, it just went, and I just kept doing it and doing it and doing it. And um, all through high school, I was the guy that got drunk every weekend. I was the guy that uh, every time we had a day off from school, I was selective, though. You know, I was careful. It was controlled drinking is what it was. And I would, if I knew that we had a day off one day, I was drunk that night. Friday night, always drunk. Saturday night, drinking more. Sunday, eh, you got to be careful. you got to go to school Monday. And I did that all through high school. Uh, all through high school. I, I don't think a single weekend went by that I, did not, that I did not get drunk and loved it, loved every minute of it. I loved it. I love it. It didn't matter if I blacked out. I was proud of blacking out. I loved blacking out. It meant I had a good time, probably. <laughs> and what I and, and what I what do we got? We, we recruiting now. <laughs> what I <laughs> what I what I didn't know was that I was headed down a path that was eventually going to. I was eventually going to become an alcoholic. And uh, I really didn't, it never occurred to me that that could happen. It just never occurred to me that this was wrong, this was something I shouldn't be doing. I just did it. It became a part of life, and I became an adult, and I kept doing it. And I couldn't understand people that didn't drink. My wife, Nancy, she was, um, we're married, we just celebrated our 27th wedding anniversary this past July, which is amazing to me that this woman stayed with me all this time. I mean, she must be one sick woman. <laughs> she went to, uh, about the time that I got sober, she went to another fellowship, and um, I don't give a shit, Al-Anon, and she went to that fellowship, and, you know, I got a little skittish over that, you know, and I said, uh, after about three, four weeks, I said, hey, uh, let me ask you something, what, what, are they, what are they saying about me over there? You know? <laughs> she said, what do you mean? They're not talking about you. I'm like, I'm so, I mean all alcohol. What are they telling you about us, we alcoholics? What are they saying? They said, we don't talk about you. So what are you going there for? You got to be going there for something. She said, no, we talk about me and us. And I said, well, what are you learning? Are you learning anything? Is it worth your time? She said, I'll never forget it. She says, well, she says, the one thing I'm learning is I am at least as sick as or maybe even sicker than you are. And I went, keep going, baby. That, Al-Anon, that is some fellowship, man. You just keep going there. They are some smart people over there, let me tell you. Because I didn't feel so bad now, you know. Because I'd done a lot of harm. You know, I, I really harmed that girl. Uh, she had no idea what she was heading into when, when she married me. I'll tell you that right now. I mean, I didn't get drunk on our honeymoon, but that was about it, you know. Um, and I, she, the next day I did, you know. But she, as a matter of fact, I had one toast. One toast. And I know that that one toast could have gone somewhere, and it didn't, because I was interested in going somewhere. <laughs> and I was able to control it at that point in my life. It's really interesting. Um, but Nancy, Nancy has really been with me uh, through, throughout the whole thing. Um, somewhere, I would say somewhere about in my 30s, I, you know, I really can't, really can't pinpoint it was, was when there was an indication that there might be a problem occurring here. Something might be happening. And uh, I became a, I became a stockbroker um, on Wall Street after I had already wrecked one business and that would, that would down the tube. 
And I was, you know, it was, it, I opened up uh, a couple of stores and um, retail uh, the, uh, food stores, gourmet food stores, you know, with delis and delicatessens and produce and all that stuff. And, um, you know, I've, Nancy, Nancy quit her job to help me run the business, and she was basically running the whole business for me. I was just... I was just fucking up everything, man. I would show up. I would come. I would drive out. The, the business was like two hours from our house, and I would drive out to the main store. And oh, Danny's here. The boss is here. The owner's here. You know. And I would come up there, and I'd just go up to the cash register and say, uh, "Give me nine hundred dollars." Okay, thanks. See you later. Everything cool? Yeah, everything's fine. And I just disappear for another day, you know. And when I worked on Wall Street, uh, that's when. That's when it, that. It sounds like it was kicking my ass then, but I really didn't care. I mean, I really didn't care about about that. And when I lost the businesses. They went down the tubes. They they were just gone. You know, we just walked away from it. You know, we just I loaded up my refrigerator with cheese and ham and just lived on that for a year. You know, and now and that was the and and my wife uh, had to go back to work and she started working in a department store down in um, she started working in uh, down on 34th Street in Midtown Manhattan. Um, down near Macy's, if you know where that is, Herald Square in that area. And I started working. As, I got my license to become a stockbroker. I figured, man, I, I blew all my money. I might as well go blow somebody else's. So, because I didn't have any yet, yet to, left to blow. And I went down uh, and I, I became a stockbroker and I started working for a couple of different uh, brokerage firms. And um, my drinking really took off when I was working on Wall Street. It was um, it's interesting because looking back now, I can see the disease. I could see it at work. Something I definitely could, and I had to learn that. I had to learn what was going on. I had no idea what was going on at the time. I thought I was just having a good time, you know. I just thought this is fun. And uh, after a while, it just wasn't fun anymore. It just wasn't fun anymore because that, you know, that obsession would kick in, and I would get that craving, and I would just, and I knew, and I didn't even know it was operative. I just had no idea. Um, I had a friend of mine. Um, I won't mention him by name. Um, how do I say his name? My friend Rich. I'll just say that. Uh, he, he's a pretty prominent guy. That's why I'm, I'm a little concerned. But um, my friend Rich and I, we were drinking buddies from, from way back. He, you know, he actually came out with me and Sal a couple of times, and we were drinking that wine, you know. And he always drank more than I did, more often than I did, more quantity than I He could, you know, drink me under the table kind of a thing. And it's interesting because... What's interesting about that is the guy is not an alcoholic. I mean, you sit us down at a table and just, we could pound him down. He'll drink me right under this table. And it just won't affect him. He, he, he would build tolerance and it would just keep going. One time we were, um, one time he and I were having a particular, he's, he also works on Wall Street. He's, uh, he's a trader down there. And, um, one night, one day we were having a really particularly bad day. I mean, the, the markets were going crazy, and we were just, you know. He calls me up. He goes, Danny, he says, we got a drink today. And I said, yeah, sounds like a good idea. <laughs> I was planning to anyway. <laughs> Might as well have some company. And he said, uh, all right. He goes, we'll meet, we'll meet at 4 o'clock. We'll meet on the corner of Broad and Wall Street, and we'll go, we'll go down the road and have, and have a, a couple of beers or something. I said, that sounds good to me. About a half hour later, I'm watching the clock. I mean, that's, now that's all I could think about. That's all I could think about. I pick up the phone, call him up. We're still going, right? Oh, yeah, we're still going. Yeah, no problem. He called me back half hour after that. You're st we still got plans, right? We got a date. Yeah, oh, yeah, we're going. I, I, honest to God, we must have gone back and forth four or five times with each other just to make sure the plan was still in place. I mean, he could taste it. I could taste it. We couldn't wait to get there. And uh, and sure enough, I went down. I got I, I, Four o'clock, you know, we call that the bell. Four o'clock would go off, and I went down the corner, and there he was standing there. How you doing? Shake hands. And we just, boom, just shot down the block. Our, you know, power ties were flapping in the wind behind us like this as we're going down. And we get into the, we get into the bar, and uh, we sit down, and I order two large frosted mugs of whatever beer we were drinking at the time. And I put, a, I mean, these things looked... Like, this was Madison Avenue advertising. You know, their companies would pay a million dollars just to get that on a, on a, on a film somewhere so they could put it in a magazine. You know, the foam was coming. I mean, beautiful picture. And you just have to admire it, you know, before you drink it down. And I drank it down, and he drank his, put, slammed my mug down on the bar. Another round, you know. 
And he goes, no, 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 not me. I got to go home. What the fuck? Are you out of your mind? Wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. We're missing something here. We're missing something here. Didn't we just, aren't we, aren't we, you, you were dying for a beer. He says, yeah, I got it. Now I'm fucked. I got this beer down in my belly. And I want another one right now. I mean, I am screwed, ladies and gentlemen, because that, he was obsessing for that beer. I don't know what was going through his head. I don't know if that's the first drink in sanity. I don't know what that is. But to me, he was just as anxious to get that thing down as I was. And when he got it, he was fine. He was fine. Imagine obsessing to drink that badly and getting it and it's okay. And we walked, you know, we, he wanted to leave and, you know, me, the, the way I would do it is I just, you know, all right, we'll go, you know. And we walked over to World Trade Center. He had to catch his uh, train out to New Jersey. And I would pretend, I, I told him, yeah, I'm going home too. Yeah, I had enough too. You know, meanwhile, I'm going to get on the, the subway. He's going to get on his train, go out to New Jersey. I'm going to get on my train. I'm going to get off at the next stop because that's where I'm going. There's, there's a, there's a, a um, I almost said, uh, I almost said titty bar. I just didn't want to say that. But I, uh, a, a strip joint up the block, and that's where I'm going, you know. 7.30 that night, he was home with his kids eating dinner. And I didn't come home at all. I did not come home. And I don't, and I wanted to. I wanted to go home. And I couldn't go home. I came home that night. It was daylight again. And my wife would just look at me. And sometimes she'd be sleeping, sometimes she wouldn't. And she would just look at me. And she'd say, you did it again. You did it again. Why did you do that again? And she would ask me this. I swear, I think she must have asked me this a hundred times. Why did I do that again? And I, and I just gave her the best answer I knew. I don't know. I don't know. More often than not, though, earlier on, I, was just, I would come up with some, you know, we just got to talking. You got to talking till like, the next day? What the hell? How could you? Oh, that must have been some conversation. The sun came out, and you were still talking. It was, it was dreadful. And, that, you know, and that kind of thing would go on for, that thing went on for years. It went on for years. It got to the point where uh, she, was, she had really had it with me. I mean, I was in trouble every week with my wife. And um, after, I was a stockbroker for a while, and then I decided, you know what, being a stockbroker is great, but I'm more important than this. Instead of being a stockbroker, now I'm going to be an investment banker which I think I told you is basically a stockbroker, except it sounds good. You know, you get to be the boss of the other stockbrokers. And, um, and I started running a, a brokerage firm with a friend of mine. And um, <laughs> after one particular uh, whoopee weekend, as, we, as, uh, as you might hear, in the, it might be a good word from the big book, a whoopee weekend, um, I, you know, I was already in hot water and was like, a, I think it was a Tuesday or Wednesday night, and um, I had been drinking all weekend, and I was hungover. And I, coming to work on Wall Street when you're hungover is a real pain in the ass because most of the other people are not hungover. Most of the people are doing okay. They're doing fine. They went out, they drank, and they went home like my friend did. And, 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 they're, and they're on top of their game. And I always felt like I was not on top of my game at all. I was always... Nursing a hangover, or just you get that fuzzy feeling, even if you're not puking, you know. I wasn't a big puker. I wasn't a huge, I, once in a while I would puke, but I wasn't a huge puker. <laughs> that lady laughing, she's a puker. I could tell right now. <laughs> I'll tell you that. I know a puker. I, I, I've, I've hung with your type. <laughs> Nobody's immune from it, though. And, um, geez, I forgot where I was. Well, I, um, I managed to secure this office space in, in what's called the Wall Street Tower, on the 38th floor of the Wall Street Tower, 20 Exchange Place. And, man, it was so cool. I was like, I could see New Jersey from my office. I could see the Brooklyn Bridge. Brooklyn Bridge was about this big down there. And I could see Brooklyn, and jets used to go by underneath me. Well, it wasn't that high. But I would see jets go by like this. I felt, I felt that in the clouds, you know. I felt like I was in the clouds. And I had arrived, and, and, and I, was a, I was an executive on Wall Street, you know. 
riding around in limousines and uh, coming to and from work, being driven in all the time. Meanwhile, on the way back, I'd say, stop off at Chinatown, you know, and, and I couldn't even get out of the back seat. I'd, I'd make the driver go get me a six-pack, and I'd be sitting back there. Insane stuff, crazy, crazy stuff. One night, uh, one it was either like a Tuesday or Wednesday, and I was already in trouble with Nancy. And, you know, what's funny about Nancy, too. She, I, I told you we were married 27 years, but she and I were together. I met her when she was 15 years old. I was 17 years old. And, I, you know, when she met me, I had a bottle of Michelob beer in his hand. And my clothes, you know, my clothes were all ripped because I, you know, fancied myself a hippie type person, you know. And um, she didn't have a clue that this was going to go where it is. I, I don't know. If it, I, there's nothing inherently wrong with walking around with a beer in your hand all the time, I guess. But if you're an alcoholic... I don't know, or a potential alcoholic at that time. She invited me to her 16th, her sweet 16th birthday party, and um, all my friends came. <laughs> all my friends came. All my friends with leather, all the Bronx kids, you know, with leather jackets. They look like the Fonz, you know. They're all cool. They're all like this, you know. And they all got beer and six packs and everything. Well, Nancy got absolutely shit faced for the first time in her life. She was. Blotto, Blitzo, whatever you want to call it. She was throwing up. She was sick as a dog. First time in her life. And I was in big trouble with her parents, I'll tell you that much, because her parents had left, let, you know, trust, entrusted her with her friends in the house. And the next day, I called her up, and I said, uh, hello, can I speak to Nancy, please? And hello, Danny. How are you today? Oh, I'm fine. Can I speak to Nancy, please? Yes, put on Nancy, and I said, how do you feel? She goes, I'm so sick. She goes, I will never do that again. And she never did it again. She never did it again. I can't believe oh, Why would anybody not do that again? <laughs> I mean, what, my first drink, I got, I, got, I got a blackout. I puked all over the place. I was walking on the ledge of a 12-story building. Don't remember any of it. This is what I'm told. I don't know. I don't understand non-alcoholics. How could they just pl- they just plan not to do it again and don't do it? I don't know. <sighs> but working on what Nancy was very uh, she was she was just about fed up, and she had she had said to me, "Look, you, you got to cut down. You got to you know you just can't do this." And and it, it was Tuesday or Wednesday night, and I was just getting my hangover was just leave, letting up. See, I didn't drink every day. I'm always an everyday drinker. I didn't drink around the clock. I'm not going to bullshit you and tell you any of that stuff. It's not how much I drank. It's what it did to me. And I, ne- I didn't lose my wife. There's a lot of stuff that, 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 that I didn't have to go through that a lot of people talk about having to go through. <laughs> but none of that stuff makes me an alcoholic. It's the stuff I'm telling you now that kind of points in the right direction, at least. And uh, I figured... I want to drink again. This hang, I'm starting to feel pretty good now. I want to drink again, but I can't. I can't do it. I can't do it. Nancy's going to be really upset with me. I'm going to get divorced or something. It's just not going to be good. I just can't stand it. I'm going to call her up, and I'm going to, I'm going to get me an insurance policy. I'm going to call up Nancy, and I'm going to tell her I'm coming home. I'm going to tell her what time I'm coming home. I tell her what we're going to do after I get home. I'll, make, I'll just make dinner plans with her, and then I'll have to keep my promise and, then, and that'll be it. I'll be fine. I see some people smirking already. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you how it didn't work out. I called her up, went through the whole deal. Come home, honey. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the train. I'm going to go up to Penn Station. I'm going to be on the 742. I'm going to get off at the earth stop. I'll be there at 8. I'll get off at 8.15. It's 10 minutes to walk home. Let's have dinner at, let's have dinner at 20 to 9. Beautiful. I'm making chicken cutlets. That's what she said. That's what she said. I'm making chicken cutlets for dinner. You have chicken cutlets here, right? It's chicken. Schnitzel. But it's chicken. <laughs> and um, I knew I knew that I'd be able to do it. I was absolutely positive I'd be able to do it because I was a man of my word. And I got I left right on time. I got out. I, Packed up my briefcase. I closed the door. I went outside. Got into the got into the uh, the little lobby for the elevator. Pressed the button. Got into the elevator. 
I was on the 38th floor, pressed the lobby button, just stood there going down. The elevator opened on the lobby floor. I stepped out onto the, you know, marble floor. And I don't know if it was, maybe, maybe the elevator just went down too fast or something. Maybe I got the bends or something, some nitrogen bubbles in my brain. I don't know what happened. <laughs> but something happened to me from the 38th floor to the lobby, and I thought, you know, since I'm going home anyway, I mean, I am going home, I can have one drink, I can have one, and, and that's it, just one. And I'm going to, and damn it, I'm going to have one, just one. And I walked across that lobby, and God help me, I got to the, there's these uh, uh, brass doors, brass revolving doors in the front of the building. And I remember thinking how cool it would be to have one. It would be really cool to have one. As a matter of fact, I'm going to make this a plan now. I must have one. I must, must, must have one. And I'll tell you what, no, I'm, there was a method to my madness. Okay? This has nothing to do with alcoholism. <laughs> this has to do with genius, my friend. I said, I must have one because if I have one, I'll come home and she will smell it on my breath. And that, you marry guys. Did you, did you ever have a wife to smell your breath? You get, honey, you're home. <laughs> Damn. You're sniffing the wax out of my ears, honey. Stop it. God. You don't think I noticed that? She will smell liquor on my breath, and she, it will prove to her that I can drink just like everybody else. All that other bullshit was just exactly as I said it was, accidental. Just, I forgot about the time, that's all. Just forgot to look at the clock for eight or ten hours, that's all. <laughs> Nothing to do with me. I'm not a bad man. And I can come home just like everybody else. Everybody else comes home with booze on their breath. I can come home with booze on my breath and not have a problem. And that's what I'm going to do. So now i got a plan. I'm going to have that drink. Must. I get down. I walk around the corner. We have these, uh, these like little Irish, they're, they're sort of like uh, imitation Irish pubs. Uh, they call, they, they're all over Manhattan and New York. They, they serve, you walk in, they have, mashed pota- uh, they have boiled potatoes, cabbage. You know what I'm talking about? It's just, it, and all the smell just hits you at the, at the same time. It's just corned beef sawdust and puke. It just comes up and goes right into your nose. And it's like, oh, yeah, I love that. That's great. Man, it's just that smell. It's just, I don't know. I don't know. The, the cabbage ruins it sometimes. And, and I walked in, and I said, um, here's my drink. I ordered a drink. I, at that time, I was drinking uh, vodka and water, I think, because everybody knows that vodka and water, nobody can smell that, right? Nobody can smell vodka and water. So I said, a bit, you know, if I have vodka and soda, that'll keep it bubbly and then she'll be able to... Now I'm trying to make myself smell like booze. I'm trying to make my... I'm, I, all the times I went home trying to make sure that Nancy didn't smell any booze on me, and now I'm trying to smell like booze because it'll prove that I'm not an alcoholic. So I ordered one, one glass of, glass of uh, vodka and, and, and um, soda. And the guy puts it down. This is real top-shelf stuff, you know, whatever it was. He puts it down, and it's this tiny little glass. It's about... I forgot how small the glasses were in this place. No, don't laugh yet. And it was watered down. Okay, and I said, you know, this is not one drink. I'm, I'm entitled to one drink for three of these would be one drink. That's three of these. He gave me, he gave me another two. He said, I mean, he didn't get, you know. Now I, th- I don't think they let you have three drinks at once at the bar anymore. I don't know, but that time he'd let me, and I put him down put them down, put it down, put the glass down. Well, I don't think I need to tell you. Uh, Somehow the the trains just went off schedule that night. Just the 742 just never rolled in. And there I was getting on a train, heading for Murray Street again with that titty bar again. I don't know what's the deal with that place. It must have a, a, it's got an allure to it or something. I don't know. I have something to do with those little g strings or something, but and I got on the train and um, and I, the funny thing is when I got on the train, I really felt like uh, I really felt like I was going through with the planet. This was perfect so far. It was absolutely perfect. I didn't feel like another drink. I, I, I felt that that was enough, and I got on on the train. It was absolutely packed. 
you know, you, it, subways, but many, many guys have been on sub, subways before. It's like this. You got somebody in front of you like this. You got somebody back of you like that. And you just hang on for dear life and hope nobody farts. And you just, <laughs> or has breath like mine. And I'm, and, I, and I'm hanging on, onto the train and, and there's this man standing next to me. And I got my briefcase in my hand and there's this woman in front of me. Gorgeous woman. Too close to me woman. In a purple dress. And I'm too close to this woman. And, uh, and she keeps backing up into me and I keep backing, you know, cause I, I just, you know, I don't want to be arrested, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and I'm hanging on to this guy and I look at this guy and I, and I, and I take a look at him and I see, man, this guy was really impressive. This guy was 100% total Wall Street. He was perfect. Picture perfect. He was a black guy and he had, uh, like a grain beard, just perfectly trimmed like this. And he had a, uh, he had a suit like mine. It was a um, um, pinstripe suit, dark pinstripe suit, and he was carrying the Wall Street Journal. He had a gold watch that I could tell was real, and he had uh, he had all kinds of gold on his. He had gold cufflinks, and he just looked so. And I thought to myself, isn't it wonderful how these black people can mingle with us white people, successful white people? In Lower Manhattan, in the financial district, it's just wonderful how they've climbed up from where they were before. <laughs> now, here's a guy that's probably who I mean, the guy looked like a million bucks, you know. And he looked, and I'm just admiring this man. And he turns to me and he looks and he goes, "I smell your alcohol." <laughs> and I went, "I went, well, then why don't you?" Move back to the, in the back of the train where you belong then. Something really racist and bigoted like that, which I'm totally ashamed of today, that I said that to that man. And I got so upset, I just, it just upset me to the core, and I felt, I, and I, I felt the rumbling in my stomach, and it just, you know what was coming up, it just came up like this. It just went like that, and I knew it was coming, I looked at that purple lady's ass. <laughs> And I knew, I thought, man, she thought she was going to get a surprise a few minutes ago. Wait till she gets a surprise now. <laughs> this is really going to upset her husband, probably. <laughs> and, you know, we're, we're very resourceful alcoholics. I just snapped up my briefcase, hit the two buttons, blah, right into it, snapped it shut, put it down, and just stood there like that, like nothing happened, man. Nothing happened. And this guy is looking at me, this woman, this poor woman in front of me has no idea how many bodily fluids she'd avoided, but she, this man is looking at me in horror. He's got his eyes open, and I'm, you know, I'm lying when I say this, but I wish I would have thought it, I would have said, smell that motherfucker. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to use bad language. It seemed that it seemed appropriate at the moment. He, I get off at the next train, at the next stop, and I just carry that briefcase. And let me tell you something. I never opened that briefcase again. I had some important work in that briefcase. Important. I, I was working on an offering, and I had worked on it all week. And it, and I finally, I still have it. I keep it as a souvenir. I should have brought it. I did open it, and it's all in there. It's all, I, I opened it up about, oh, God, it must be about eight years ago. It's all in there. It's all, it's all, it's black. It wasn't black then, but it's all black now. I just shut it. I said, you know what? See, I'd hid it for so long. I just took it and hid it away. But after I got sober, I came across it, and I thought it would be cool to hold on to it. You know? Maybe I'll go to Denmark one day, and I'll be able to show it to them. You know? But, you know, what is it? Why, why, why did my plan go so wrong? Next, next, you know, one minute, I'm, and I wasn't even drunk yet. <laughs> I, but I got off that train, and, uh, and I didn't come home. And, and, and that was a series of my, that, that was my whole adult life. Just, we didn't have any kids yet, you know. <laughs> I don't think that was any stroke of genius. I think that was a blessing from God, because... Uh, we just figured we'd just wait until I straighten up <laughs> or whatever. Things, weren't re things got, 
And I look put on a, put on a good show. The reason I worked on Wall Street was really not because I was so qualified to work there, but because I wanted, I just felt important. I just felt like an important guy working there. I could drink and be important at the same time. And, 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 and I was a shitty investment banker, let me tell you. As you can understand, as you can get the gist of now, I wasn't any good at it. I mean, I, I knew what to do, but I could never carry anything out. You know, a deal here or there, and uh, I would make some money, and then I'd make lots of money, and then suddenly, boom, it'd all be gone. And I'd make lots of money, lots of money, lots of money, and then, boom, it'd all be gone again. And it's not because I'm an investor. I'm, I'm screwing with other people's money, you know. I'm just earning commissions, but I just couldn't hold on to it. I just couldn't hold on to it. And I felt so important. And that was, that was more important to me than looking important and sounding important was more important to me than supporting my family or supporting my wife in a decent, in a decent style. You know, we lost houses and all that, all that, all that crybaby stuff. Man, I can tell you shit that would have you weeping in your seats. All, all the stuff. It's all the stuff that you, that's happened to you guys too. I, I know that. And we share that. <laughs> But what we also share is this inability to not, not drink. I can make, I mean, I really needed to not drink that day. And I did anyway. And I needed, after I did drink, not to drink anymore. And I did anyway. And it just happened over and over and over again. It just kept going. It just kept going. Does anybody identify with that? You know, this is the stuff that I tell a newcomer stuff like that. This is what I tell a newcomer when I sit down. I don't tell them... I could leave out the part about puking in the briefcase, I suppose. That, you know, not everybody can identify with that. But... <laughs> but I know you I know, I know she puked. We know that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not picking on you. I just couldn't stop, and I, could, I couldn't drink. I couldn't drink when I wanted to. I couldn't stop when I wanted to. I couldn't not drink, and I couldn't drink safely. I mean, it all falls right in. It's all right there. We talked about it all weekend long, especially when we were talking about step one the other day. And that's the kind of stuff I like to talk to newcomers about because I want them to identify with that sort of stuff. I want them to look back in their past and say, you know, we mentioned it the other day. I told him what I knew about alcoholism. And this is the time that we talk about this stuff. We're sitting down with a guy, you know, and it's kind of cool to sit up here and, and, and for me to hash this, sh to hash this out uh, with you guys. Uh, but, you know, am I going to go into a, a, a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and tell and get a laugh like that? Why? I am not a comedian. That's, yeah, that's kind of humorous, but, you know, save that for some, you know, let me go down to the improv or something and tell a funny joke and get an audience laughing. That doesn't belong in a meeting of alcoholics. And we could be funny in alcoholics and honest, but what's the point? What what is the point for a newcomer? If a newcomer walks in there and he hasn't puked in his briefcase or shouted uh, racial remarks at a, at a at a at a at an innocent black man, what's the point? Well, he's done other stuff. He's done other evil stuff too. Big shit. A lot of people do a lot of evil stuff. They're not alcoholics. A lot of people do a lot of stupid things. Doesn't mean they're drunks. Doesn't mean they're alkies. Doesn't mean that they have an obsession for alcohol. It doesn't mean that they have a craving once they have any. It doesn't mean anything like that. I have a friend of mine. I have a friend of mine who, he's almost like my friend Rich that I told you about, who seemed to obsess for this, for the alcohol as much as I did. And then suddenly when he got it, he was all done and through. He's all, he's like the opposite. I'm not opposite, <clears throat> but he's on the other side, he's on the other side of the alcoholic equation. Skippy's the kind of guy, his name is Skippy. Skippy's the kind of guy, pe people in the United States will think that's funny, I, you know that, but his name is Skippy and he lives in Connecticut. That's funny, believe me. <laughs> he, um, Skippy, I love Skippy. Skippy drinks like a fish. I mean, he, he's another guy that we, we just drank all the time and, um, you know, we all kind of went our separate ways. He went into, he, he graduated from college and he went and did his thing. My friend Rich went into finance like I did, and, and you know, we continued to drink there. <clears throat> Skippy kind of went off on his own world. And Skippy was the kind of guy, I know some of you are just like him in this respect. And if you're not, you know somebody that is just like him. He's the kind of guy that, you know, you don't want to, you want to be very careful before you invite him to your wedding. Okay, you just want to be on guard a little bit. 
maybe you want to talk about you want to talk about this first with some people make sure you know make sure this you might have to take some precautions because the Skippy Skippy's coming and Skippy is going to get loaded and we don't know what he's going to do he might start throwing stuff he might start swinging from the chandeliers and then the good thing about Skippy though is then he's going to disappear we're not going to see him for a week He's going to be. We're going to find him in Las Vegas someplace, with 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 two chicks on each arm and drinking beers and everything else, and that's a problem for Skippy because Skippy's married now. <laughs> but he would just. He's the guy also, like on New Year's Eve, who would just just go absolutely ape shit. Planned it all year round, proper practically. Couldn't wait to. Couldn't wait for. Man, I'm drinking. New Year's Eve. I am going to get wasted. I am going to drink until I drop dead. And then we find him in Vegas, you know, on on on, Ju- on January 3rd or 4th. We'd find him out there somewhere and have to pull his ass in. And that's the way he drank. But he didn't have to drink that way. He decided to drink that way. Skippy liked being an asshole. <laughs> that's basically what what it comes down to. He liked the effect of the alcohol. He liked the way he it lubricated his his psyche, where he could go out and and, and get raunchy with women and all that kind of stuff. Got his courage up. But Skippy's solution is very simple. He, Skippy doesn't do that anymore, by the way. Skippy doesn't come here either. Skippy just decided, that's no way for me to live. I'm just not going to drink. I'm going to put the plug in the jug, and I'm just not going to drink. And that's what he does. If he just doesn't drink, he can't get drunk. And he doesn't. Myers was mentioning uh, strawberries earlier. And, that, you know, that's not a, that's a pretty damn good good example strawberries you can use, use any one you want you use uh, some people allergic to peanuts some people allergic to strawberries bee stings my sister happens to be allergic to strawberries and if she has one strawberry she has an abnormal reaction she breaks out in hives and gets itchy her eyes you know you look like you put quarters in her eyes you know they're just like little slits she gets itchy and all it's, it's horrible anybody here allergic to strawberries or food got food allergies nobody Alcohol. <laughs> well, she has that reaction. Now, I don't get that, but she does. But I never, ever had a problem with her. And it was never, you know, we never found her uh, on Christmas Eve in the basement shoving strawberries down her throat. <laughs> oh, man. Hives. I hope I don't get hives. This time it'll be different. I got some calamine lotion now. I'm okay. Or, or uh, you know, stop short at a light and a pint of strawberries comes rolling out from underneath her seat. Hey, what do you got? Strawberries under there? <laughs> don't drink and eat straw. Don't drive and eat strawberries. Oh my God. She's, we'd have to lock her up in a, we would have to put her away somewhere, man. We'd, we'd have to lock her up if she were doing that. She, that would mean she's nuts. But we don't. She has a solution. She just doesn't eat strawberries. That's why I laugh when I, when I, when I go into, I mean, I just don't drink. Well, if I could just don't drink, like my sister just doesn't eat strawberries, I, would, I wouldn't have the problem. I know that I crave alcohol if I take any. That's, that sounds like a viable solution. It sounds perfect. But yet there I am, calling up Nancy, setting up my, setting up my, my, my barriers, and breaking right through them again. Anytime. Anytime. I don't even need a reason. We talk about threadbare excuses. I guess they're always threadbare. They're all threadbare. They, I didn't even need it. Just do it. Just drink. Forget about the promise. And my sister, uh, my sister actually, she doesn't real. I've, I've explained this to her. Try to explain alcoholism to my sister, and she doesn't get it. She doesn't get it. She just thinks it's a matter of willpower. If I could stop eating strawberries. Then you can stop. If, if that's if what you say is true, you're allergic to alcohol. Then just stop drinking alcohol, and, and your problem's over. And that's what Skippy does. Skippy, Skippy's got a Skippy and Rich both have drinking problems. I understand that. That's not normal to that's not normal to be on a phone. Two adults working on Wall Street, controlling millions of dollars of people's money. Are you going to meet me for a beer? It's like being 16 years old. That's ridiculous. That's asinine. There's something wrong with that. He needs help. <laughs> he needs help. But, you know, he might be able to go get that straightened out somewhere. He might be able to go to a shrink or go for counseling or something else and get that straightened out. Skippy, on the other hand, yeah, he could probably get that straightened out too. 
Can he? I don't know. Why would he have to? He just doesn't drink. What is he? He doesn't need to come. He did try AA, by the way. And uh, we did talk about it, and he decided, he's, I don't need it, man. I can stay away from a drink. I don't have to come here. He felt like it was a prison. That's the way he felt. Obviously, we don't agree with that. But he's doing fine. He hasn't had a drink in years. If he does, he's screwed. Finally came along, uh, you know, it was just that same cycle over and over and over and over again, and, and, I, and I just had to stop. And, you know, Nancy said to me one day, I, she was up waiting for me again, hundreds of times, this poor girl. you got to meet my wife. Uh, you know, I don't know, there's some pictures over on the Internet. you got to, no, not those pictures. <laughs> now I'm talking about Becky and, Becky and whatever, Terry, whatever the other one is. No, no, no. These are nice family pictures. Um, <laughs> I come home at night. She's sitting on the couch, crying. You did it again. I know. Why? I don't know. You got to stop. I will. Good night. <laughs> but this time it didn't wind up being good night. She just sat there looking at me, and I sat there. She says, you got to do something. And I just wanted to go to bed. I said, I will. Now let's go. Dan, you got to do something. I can't live like this. Okay, I promise. I'll do something. Come on, let's go to bed. You don't understand. I'm done. You have to do something. What are you going to do? I said, the first thing that can't, I said, I'll go to AA. Sounds like a plan. Now let's go to bed. <laughs> and um, I wound up, uh, I wound up going to. Uh, it's funny uh, how things happen. Uh, I didn't go right away. I waited, I waited till the weekend. Uh, I called up. I did call up AA the next day, and I called up uh, uh, Queens in, in, uh, Queens Intergroup office, and this guy told me the most ridiculous thing. So I just said, no way. He said, you have to stop drinking now, and uh, th- and you need to go to a meeting tonight. Then fuck you. Boom, click. What is, what is this guy? I got to stop drinking now, and I got to go to a meeting tonight. You know, and, he, and he threatened to send somebody over to see that that happened, too. And I, was not, I wasn't buying that. So I wanted to go on my own terms. I went to a meeting. The next day it was a meeting that I could walk to. It was within walking distance of my house. And I walked in there, and it just so happened to be a big book meeting. And you know the ones that they tell you, you're not ready for those meetings yet. Don't go to those big book meetings. Go to the sharing meetings where you can share and get things off your chest, you know, because that's really what your problem is. You know, you need to share this stuff. Don't go to the big book meeting. That's not for you yet. That's too advanced. Well, I walked into this meeting. It was a big book meeting. And um, they had the big book. This looks like a third edition. And... Uh, it was the third edition, and, and they were reading out of the big book. It, and they were on Bill's story. They were on Bill's story. Now, here I am, a down-and-out drunk, bro- no money. I'm totally broke at this point. My car's not running. The rent's not paid. The electricity's about to go off. Barely have enough food because I'm not bringing home enough money. The only reason we had any money at all and any roof over our head is because Nancy's working in the store down on 34th Street and bringing home the money. I'm not making anything. I can't even afford to dry clean my suits anymore. So I can't afford to look important anymore. And this book, and they start reading Bill's story, and I'm reading about this this obvious loser working on Wall Street. His wife works in a department store (laughs) on 34th Street. Get this out of here. This is spooky, man. What is this? I think I broke the binding on this book. Sorry, I shouldn't be throwing this book around. And I'm saying, what the? F- Are you kidding me? Well, let me tell you something. By the time they got around, they didn't have enough books in that meeting. This book was floating around. And it got to me. I was, I, I was wiped out. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I just couldn't believe it. I mean, how did you? How did you? What? The key, you can't write, you know, people say you're talking about me. I can tell you're talking about me. It's a freaking book. 
How could you write a book? How could you know I was coming and write and publish a book? <laughs> Stupid. I couldn't believe it. And they took that book and I watched that book come. Oh, I guess I got to read now. Uh, I can impress these people with my skills, you know. And, it, and then book went, went over my head and over to the next guy. And I'm like, why did they do that? Why wouldn't they let me read? And um, I met some real cool people there, and uh, they suggested I go to another meeting that night, you know. And I thought that was a little excessive. I've already been to one that's that morning. I mean, why would I have to go to another one at night? And uh, they they started drilling me and said, well, just go. You'll meet some more people. It's a, it's it's a it's more of a home group atmosphere. This isn't really this is kind of a not really a group. It's more of a just a meeting. And, uh, but it's a big book meeting. Just, just go over there. And they, they were right. There were a lot of nice, loving people in that group that I met. And I walked in there. I came up. It, it happened to be one of the largest groups around. They had like, uh, they had one, two, three, four. They had four meetings going on every, uh, every Wednesday night and every Saturday night. And sometimes, sometimes only three, but depending on the night. But there's always like three or four different kinds of meetings going on in that place. They had a beginner's meeting. They had an open meet, an open, uh, speaker meeting. They had a big book meeting all the way upstairs. And then they had a, um, Meyer's favorite meeting, an open discussion meeting upstairs. We call them, we, I'm sure, uh, we call them open disgusting meetings, some of us. <laughs> and I walked in, there was this guy, Big Tony, outside with an earring, and um, really nice guy. I'd never met him before, and I, I walked in with my son. You know some of the story already. I walked in with my son under my arm, and he, and he said, and he took one look at me, and he said, there's the beginner's meeting is right in there, in that room there. I said, I'm not, I'm not a beginner. <laughs> he said, no. I said, no, I was in a meeting this morning. I went this morning to already to a meeting. He says, that's better. Just go in there. And that was when I walked in and I, and I met my first sponsor that I told you about, Barry, who dragged me out of there and 12, and, and actually 12-stepped me outside of a meeting, which I'm already in a meeting, but what he was doing was he was qualifying me. He was showing me how to make a determination as to whether or not I am an alcoholic. And just like uh, just like we read today, uh, several times I read it. Myers read it. Page uh, in our book it's page 44, but it's where uh, chap on ch the beginning of chapter four, we agnostics. In the preceding chapters, you have learned something of alcoholism. We hope we have made clear the distinction between the alcoholic and the, non the non-alcoholic. And I could not make that distinction until I was taught how to make that distinction. And, you know, I don't want to give the impression that we're proposing that you sit in the back of the meeting with notes saying, Judy, alcoholic? No. Fred, alcoholic? Yes, he's an alcoholic. You know, and then start writing down people. And, and nobody's going to do that. That's stupid. Nobody's telling other people. We don't like to make that proclamation. We do not like to proclaim another individual as being alcoholic. I don't like to either. But I damn well better know enough about alcoholism like Barry did to me to show me how to make that determination myself. Because only I can make that determination. Because if I make the determination for you, I rob you of that experience. You're not going to believe it all the way down. There's always going to be that lurking notion. That, that just is. It just happens. You can't identify yourself as an alcoholic. How could you trust yourself? You're... You've been lying your whole life. If, you, if, if you're like me, lying to myself, I'm an alcoholic. Well, maybe I'm lying. You always tell an alcoholic lying. His mouth is moving, right? Well, we do it to ourselves, too. And by qualifying myself as an alcoholic, now what happened was, I think I told you that Barry died of a, of a uh, he had a massive coronary like three months later, which totally devastated me because he was my lifeline. He told me everything you need to know about recovery and your whole life is right here. And that seemed absolutely impossible because it can only be about alcoholism. It can have nothing to do with my life. But he insisted that it did. And I swear to this day that if Barry was alive, he is the man that would have taken me through this, and he wasn't. And I wish he would. And I, and I miss him like I just miss him. I just miss that man. And... That was 10 years ago. I still miss him. And I only knew him for three months. It's amazing. What happened was I fell into the fray. I fell back into the group. And instead of sticking, sticking with the people who had that answer, I stuck, I just 
started listening to the slogans. I didn't work the steps. I worked the slogans. One day at a time. Keep it green. <laughs> you don't have that one? Come on, you know keep it green, right? No? That's okay. Put it this way. Keep it green is 180 degrees opposite of how we, of how, of anything that we learned in Alcoholics Anonymous. It tells me that just remember, remember your last drink, kid. Just remember your last drink and you won't drink. If I remember the pain of my last drink, I'm not going to drink. Does that sound like AA to you? Does that sound like anything in that big book? No, it's a complete opposite. I cannot bring that memory with sufficient force to keep me from the next drink. It just can't happen. There's a mental blank spot. The queer twist. And I moved away from, uh, from my home group and, um, I was coming up on five years short of my second, my second anniversary. And that's why I love stories, some of the stories in the book, like Fred, you know, Fred the accountant. It was the end of a beautiful day. There wasn't a cloud on the horizon. Bam! Drunk again. And, uh, and I was, you know, I was reaping the benefits that we, that we all get when we stop drinking because, you know, it's true. Life does get better when we stop drinking. I can't deny that. That's exactly what happened to me. My life got better when I stopped drinking. I stopped peeing in my pants. I stopped puking in briefcases. I stopped all the other stuff. I was starting to get the respect of my wife back. She was happy I wasn't drinking, but I wasn't changing inside. You know, it's like it's glass ceiling. Things just get better and better. My car's running now. I started, and I got another job, not on Wall Street anymore, but at least I was bringing home some money and getting a little of my dignity back, so to speak. And it's like a glass ceiling. You just go up. I just went up like this, and um, and I had started a new career. Everything was going great. Five days short of my second anniversary. Couldn't wait. Was going to go down to New York and celebrate with Tony, by the way, who had the same sobriety date. And I get in my car. I, I mean, it was a great day. I had just hired a couple of managers. I had made a lot of money. Our sales were good. Business was booming. We were looking for a house. All that material stuff, all that stuff that if I only get that first, I'll be okay. If I only get a house, I'll get, I'll be okay. If my wife would just love me and move back with me, I'll be okay. If, you know, all that stuff, if I had some money, if I had a job, all that stuff had come back already. I was used to it. It was there. And I, and I, and I only knew that I deserved more. You know, that still wasn't enough, but hell, it sure as hell beat, beat the way it was when I first walked into that meeting on that, you know, that self-pity stuff. And I got in my car. And it was a warm day. It was in the fall. It was too warm for the fall. It just, it just felt nice. And I rolled down a window and I thought, man, I'm tired. What a wonderful day. It's too bad I can't drink. It's just too bad. Because I know I can't drink. This is, you know, we, uh, you have that, do you remember a commercial called Miller Time? No? This is like Miller Time. That's, that's, that, that's an old commercial. That this, I deserve to sit down. This is the time to kick up your boots, sit down, and have a nice drink. And I deserve that. It's too bad I can't do it. And I'm telling you, I wish to God, I hope someday I can add a little bit more to this story. I wish I could tell you what I drank, where I drank, how much I drank. I wish I could tell you that I can't. I don't know what happened after that. I have absolutely no memory. I know that a day and a half later, I woke up in a motel room, all by myself, naked, shivering. There was uh, there was porno playing on the on the on the on the TV. I didn't turn it on. I swear to God. <laughs> the lights were off. The bathroom light was just shining in, and I was just coming out of a blackout. And I had no idea. I didn't even know what hotel I was in. I didn't even know I was in a hotel. I thought the porno lady was real. She was bouncing up and down. I thought I thought I was really looking at something. I'd be, it took me like a couple of seconds. Oh shit, that's a TV. Okay, good. <laughs> or maybe not so good. I went home that night. It, it, it was tough driving home. I, I called up my wife first of all, and I said I drank, and she said, "Come home." And I went home, and. Um, I walked into the house, and I went upstairs to my bedroom. 
And my wife was asleep. All she wanted to know was that I was safe. That's really all she wanted to know. And my son was laying in his bed, sleeping, and I went upstairs. And the pain was so intense. I mean, when I go to a meeting and I hear people talking about they're glad they don't drink because now they don't puke, that's it? That's the only benefit you got? Have you ever been to a jumping-off place? Do you know what it's like not to be able to live and not be able to die at the same time? Do you have a gazillion DWIs? It's a goddamn cakewalk. It's a goddamn cakewalk compared to the pain that an alcoholic goes through when he's at his bottom. And I was at my bottom. I was at my bottom. Define it how you wish. But I could not take any more. It didn't have to be pain. It could have been happiness. It could have been anything. I could not possibly take another thought into my head or it would have exploded. I just couldn't do it. There was nothing left to even think. And the only thing I could think of, the only thing I could think to do to relieve this was I had to die. I had to kill myself. I had a Winchester in the, in the basement. And um, I'm about to bring up something about my son. That's why I'm getting a little, a little funky here. But I walked over, I walked out of the bedroom with the intention of going down there and getting that gun. And what I was going to do is what I, frankly, what I would read in the big book, I was going to put it in my mouth and pull the t- trigger with my toe. And I don't know why, but I was going to come upstairs and do it in bed right next to my wife. And I headed out to the balcony, and I was standing on the balcony. I looked at my son, and I'm trying to put together a plot. i got to go downstairs, get the gun, get the shells. I said, oh, man, the shells. I didn't know where the shells were. So I'm sitting there for, standing there for a couple of minutes, and I remembered we had moved. They were in a box, and I kind of placed where they were. I think I'm going to go look there. I mean, I'm scheming this stuff, you know. Then I remember the shells are like 15 years old. Man. Yeah, I didn't want that shit going off in my crotch, man, because if I lived and blew my lap off, that would not be good. I mean, that's, that was a little bit too painful for me. And this was not about, I mean, I didn't need any more pain. I was looking to get to take it away. And I looked at my son, and I looked at him, and I thought, holy shit. What about him? What about, I was so proud to be, a, to be his father. And I knew that he would grow up without a daddy, just like I did, if I was out of the picture. And it just, the thought of that just, it just took me away from myself. And I, I just, how could I do that to him? How could I just disappear? I mean, I was going to, he, who knows what would happen? My wife would wake up and what, my brain would be splattered on the ceiling? My son would come upstairs, what was that noise? And there would be his daddy's head in half, blown off. Have you ever seen somebody who's shot their head off? If you have, I have. And that's what, that's what my family would be faced with. And they, they'd have to see that. And I went inside, and I laid down, and I put my face back in the pillow. And I thought, a thought that I hadn't thought of in such a long time, it not even come close to this, I cried out to God, and I said, God, you could kill me. I can't do it myself. Just take my life away. I can't live like this. I just can't live anymore. Whatever your choice is, whether I live or whether I die, just do it, please. And I'm telling you, at that moment that I said that, that I thought that in my head, just at that moment, I felt I, it was like somebody had taken a drill like, and drilled it in my head. It was like it was like steam coming out of my head. The pressure in my body, the, it was just like coming out. It was, like, it was like popping a boil on your back. It just, the pus was coming out, you know. And I just felt, I just felt relief for a moment. And it, it, believe me, the pain didn't go away. But I was able, I was able to like feel it. And um, I got up because the 
curtains in the, in, the, in the room were going like this. We had a big glass wall that looked out over a little area. And uh, the, way, the, uh, the little curtains were fluttering, fluttering and it was getting a little on the cool side. And I got up and I went over to close the window or slide the door closed because I knew where it was coming from. And I went over to those windows and they were shut up tight as a crab's ass. There was not a window open. And there was a breeze in the room. Now, that's weird, folks. That's pretty weird. And I went back into my bed and put my head down on my pillow, and I fell off to sleep. And uh, I woke up the next day. And, it, you know, really, it, it was only a few hours later. But I woke up. Man, I didn't have a hangover. I didn't feel like I didn't sleep. I felt unbelievably good. Unbelievably good. I should have been sick. I should have been hung over or something. I, I, I just felt fine. And um, a few days later, I went to uh, I, I, God put a, I believe that God put a man in my life who he just saved my life. Now, we all know the man didn't save my life, but God threw him. But he said, Danny, because I went to a meeting, I raised my hand, I said, I'm, I'm Danny, I'm an alcoholic, and I got a day back. And everybody went, oh, they couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it either. I was Mr. AA. I made, you know, I made more coffee than anybody. I put away more chairs than anybody here combined. So there. I had, I had launched more pithy shares in meetings than you would ever think of in your entire life. I was creme de la creme of AA. Because <laughs> I didn't drink that day. And if I could hang on until midnight, I'll be okay. And that's the way I did, was doing it. That's the way I was doing it. But when that insanity, that first drink came, I was done because I didn't recover. I'm going to wrap this up in a, in a moment. This man said to me, Danny says, now Mr. AA should not be looked in the face and said, why don't you try AA, Dan? That's, that's insulting. That's really insulting. And I was insulted. And I said, you, I said, do you know, do you know how long I've been coming around? Uh, two years. <laughs> he said, yeah, but, but he explained to me, you know, explained to me about the difference between the fellowship and the difference between the, the program. Two separate things. This is a fellowship that has a program. And we can come to the fellowship and enjoy that, but it has a program to offer us, and, it's, and, and it's, it'll give it to us on a silver platter. All we have to do is pick it up and use it. And he explained that to me. And this man started taking me through the steps. And we were talking about that all weekend, so I'm not going to go through every step that I ever took. But I'll tell you, he took me into his house, sat me down, qualified me. He picked up where Barry left off. He picked up where Barry left off and just took me through those steps. He had me write my inventory. And 44, 44 days is what it took. On the 44th day, I realized that it was over. I just knew it was over. I was never going to be in that position again because a loving God came into my life and made damn sure of it. And my son will always have a dad. It's pretty pitiful when the speaker starts crying, huh? But I feel very, I, I get emotional about it because it's a very real and very strong experience for me. And I haven't had a drink since. And now I get to come to great places like Denmark and tell this story and to, just to do for me what was done, just to do for you what was done for me through guys like Barry and, 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 and George, my, 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 my newer sponsor. I mean, it's just, folks, I mean, you new guys who are in here just hearing this stuff. Some of you may be just hearing this stuff for the first time. Okay. I hope you walk out of here not thinking that that guy Danny is nuts. I hope you walk out of here and, and go up to somebody else and say, could what he be saying, is that, is that possible? Is that? And I hope you hear some similar stories. Because similar, because there are stories like mine all throughout this fellowship. All throughout it. Some of you have them. I had a blast here in, in, in Denmark. Thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to, to tell you a little bit about me. I've learned a lot about you guys. I've made some good friends here. I'm, I want to, please, don't, guys, don't leave here without, like, trading emails and stuff like that.
because I really enjoy I love alcoholics and I've just I just feel so close to you guys in two freaking days I mean that's ridiculous but thank you so much for having us here thanks a lot